Hello and welcome back to this final plenary session of the Lean HE Global Conference 2021. I'm sure you'll agree we've had some phenomenal speakers over the last three days, but one of the most well known is Bill Bowser, the man who literally wrote the book on Lean in Higher Education, and I'm delighted to say that he joins us again now. For those of you who don't know Bill quite so well, he has over 35 years experience in higher education. He's currently a professor at Bowling Green State University, and his research interests include understanding and improving the application of lean principles and practices in higher education. And today he's asking, why aren't we doing Hoshin Canary or strategy deployment at our HE institutions? Bill, over to you. Thank you, Ness, and uh, thanks to Strathclyde for the amazing conference. I agree with Ness, the speakers, the topics, and the networking have really re-energized my thinking about lean higher education. So, uh, And it's also a real honor to be invited to speak to old and new friends in the global LE, lean HE community. Um, and as Ness said in my talk today, I'd like to challenge the lean higher education community um, there's a question that has been puzzling me over the last five or so years, and I think Karen Martin did a very nice job of, of actually teeing it up for me, um, which is the title of my talk, which is, why aren't we doing uh, Hoshin Kanri at our HE institutions? So there are so many opportunities for the broad application of lean principles and practices in higher education. Many of these we see on the list, we, we, we do maybe on a daily basis or a weekly basis, rapid improvement events, daily lean, um, strategic problem solving or A3 PDCA. Some may be a little bit less so to, uh, total productive maintenance, but rarely do we see, or have I seen, strategic planning, deployment, and control, or Hoshin Kanri, being used in higher education. So let me start with a very quick uh, self-graded quiz. I'd like you to name three of your institution's strategic priorities. You don't have to put them into any list. I just want you to think hard. Can you tell me what three of them are? And more importantly is the bonus question, for one of those strategic priorities, can you list one or more targets that you review weekly to confirm your alignment and direct contribution to the success of the strategic plan? Well, my guess is, not all of you could either identify them or identify the links. And this is pretty typical. Um, some research that came out in 2015 showed that the vast majority of lower or large organizations struggle with strategy execution. And uh, about half the middle managers can't name one of their company's top five priorities. So if you couldn't name one of yours, you're in, 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 in with good company. And if you think about connecting the dots between strategic priorities, only about one out of two in the C-suite, the, the, the CEO, CFO, and so forth, are able to, con to do that. And less than one out of five frontline supervisors and team leaders. So strat strategic deployment is, is needed. Now, uh, in Hutchins' book, he identifies some common points of failure in strategy deployment. Uh, sometimes it's just vague or subjective goals that managers are mysteriously expected to know. It's the communication that Karen Martin has talked about. If you don't tell people, they'll try to figure out what they're supposed to do themselves. Or it's the silo, or since we're in Scotland for, for this conference, maybe it's more of the, 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 the castles, you know, that are the, the hard walls that it's very hard to breach, that we don't really share things with each other. Uh, that uh, creates confusions or problems for strategy deployment. You know, obviously the communication and employee engagement, employees at every level of an institution don't know. Does a custodian in your institution uh, does a, a secretary in your institution know how their jobs contribute to institutional success? And then, of course, this post-planning ex uh, exhaustion. You know, we're, so, we're just so tired after doing the plan, we don't think hard enough about how we're going to implement it. 
And there's even some evidence from a, a literature review done by Albliwi and his college, uh, colleagues in 2014 that say this, this disconnect uh, or, or failure in strategy deployment can actually spill over and in, increase RIE failure when there's a weak link between continuous improvement projects and the strategic objects of the organization, or just in a, a misalignment of the goals of the RIE, quality, cost, delivery, safety, maybe with the goals of the organization. So my earnest request here, and I hope I, I, I get you thinking about this, is shouldn't we be doing more? Um, it, you know, thinking hard is our work, what we do now, really supporting strategy deployment. Do the activities your office conduct, do they actually align very closely with your institution's strategic priorities? Do your daily lean stand-ups, lean meetings, structured problem solving, do they incorporate progress on activities that directly align with strategic priorities? Are the RIEs that you do, that you facilitate, are they aligned with institutions' strategic priorities? Is that the most important criteria in determining what RIE gets approved to be conducted? And really, strategy deployment is nothing more than higher level PDCA or PDSA. So isn't strategy deployment, Hoshan Connery, part of a lean transformation? Isn't it something we should really be doing more of? So in today's session, I want to, you know, hit four learning goals. What is Hoshin Conry? Uh, what's the need for Hoshin Conry in higher education? What's the state of practice of Hoshin Conry in higher education? And then finally, how can we as practitioners promote and support Hoshin Conry? I'm going to set aside for today, at least, strategy development. I'm not going to talk about how we put together strategic plans. But I, I do want to remind people, strategy is creating that competitive advantage within an industry. And, and I've looked at scores of, of strategic plans, and I'm hard-pressed to find a, a competitive advantage in a strategic plan. Many of them, you'll see things like improve undergraduate student success. Well, what's strategic about that? Is it isn't every institution trying to improve undergraduate student success? So helping create better strategic plans, lean tools can be very valuable there as well. I mean, if you look at the what's in the box to the right, this is how we in, in, in lean uh, really help create strategic competitive advantages. So it's something that's in our wheelhouse and we can contribute to strategic plans, but we'll hold that for another meeting. So let me start with the first learning goal. What, what is Hoshin Conry? Um, and it is strategic planning deployment, as Karen Martin introduced earlier. It's the translation of high level strategic plan into sustainable results at all levels of the institution. And there are lots of ways of putting together, together the, what the Hoshin, what the characters, the Japanese characters mean to create what Hoshin Conry is all about. But when we put them together, it's really the Hoshin is like direction or compass needle. We know what the true north is. And Conry is the management, administration, or control. How are we going to get there? So, you know, uh, Pascal Dennis's uh, work uh, talks about a north star where we have a, or a ship in the storm going in the right direction. And given higher education's current environment, um, we are in a storm for sure. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So it's about engaging people in strategy deployment. We're going to talk in a minute about what an X matrix is, but that's a one page visual representation to show how all of us align and, and, and everyone contributes to what is, is going to be part of this one page visual, visual representation of strategy deployment. It's the catch ball process where we share ideas back and forth across different levels of the institution, asking how we can achieve strategy, where there might be problems and so forth. We're all uh, conversing with A3s and PDCAs where we work together to say, here's where we are now, here's where we want to go. So let's work together, put a team together and figure out how to close those gaps uh, between where we are now and what our strategic plan expects of us. I'm going to talk about 306090s, where again, uh, employees work with their supervisors to put together quarterly plans for uh, clear courses of action at every level of the institution to make sure what we do aligns with strategy. The Kanban board is that big visual board uh, in a war room where we can quickly assess are we making good progress in strategy deployment? 
And this is all full of respect for people, of course, because it's, it's, it's lean. It, we capitalize on the vast knowledge of employees at all levels. We can provide general direction, uh, but we give them some latitude because they're closest to the work. We want them to help us decide how they're going to best contribute uh, to the strategic directions of the institution. So you say, what's an X matrix? Well, me, here's a single page visual strategy deployment. And you'll see that the middle of it uh, is, is an X, and that's where it gets its name, an X matrix. And in the middle of that is really, what are the strategic aims? What are we, what are we after here? Uh, this fills it out a little bit, and I hope this, the, the post-it notes that are in there are at least uh, readable. But if you look at the bottom right corner, it says start here. So think of this a little bit like a board game. We're going to work our way around the board. Uh, at the bottom of the X, we see our three-year strategic objectives, the blue post-it note. These are the highest level strategies of the institution. We come around the corner and go to the left side of the X, and these are the, the, the shorter term, the one-year short-term objectives that, again, align clo closely with those long-term objectives. We continue up around the top of the X in the red uh, post-it note. These are the priority projects that we're going to do right now that are going to help us fulfill the one-year short-term objectives that are going to allow us to make progress towards those three-year projectives. So you can start to see the connections on this one sheet, this one visual representation where we're going. The green post-it is simply, as we come around the corner, what are the metrics that we're using for the priority projects that also are going to be the metrics for the three-year strategic objectives? And the last post-it, which is off to the right, uh, which is simply uh, the resources, who's in charge and who's contributing. If we've got it all working, you see this great connectivity. There's, there's a connection between the university level, the division levels within the university, unit levels within the division. They're all connected to make sure that we're all working upwards to support the university's level strategic plan. So as we talk about Hoshin Connery and the Pillars of Lean, we see there's a very close connection. It's all about continuous improvement. Here's where the, our, our institution is right now. Here's where our strategic plan wants to take us. What are the common goals and clarity on how we're going to get there? It creates well-defined structure of roles, what your responsibilities are, what the metrics are going to be to make sure we can manage towards improvement. And of course, it's all about respect for people, the second pillar of, of, of lean. Each employee is the expert in their own job whose views matter and are respected. They contribute uh, significantly to the development of the of the st strategy deployment and we invest in them and then we leverage their job knowledge and creativity to create the best strategic plan and strategy deployment. Now why do we need it in higher education? Um, we are in probably one of the more turbulent dynamic higher education environments in a while. COVID-19 was simply an accelerant in, in, to the turbulence that we have. Uh, some examples, and some of these might be more American-focused, but the demographic changes in our, in, our, in our country is changing dramatically. Smaller families mean smaller numbers of children going to school, mean smaller number of high school graduates, mean smaller number of traditional uh, college students. Um, we also have a population shift, um, you know, going to the, to the south and the west in the United States as well, away from the northeast, away from uh, the Midwest, and certainly in who is, uh, uh, you know, wh where are those growth? It's in more um, uh, underrepresented populations, mi minor populations rather than the majority populations. There's incredible competition in higher education, and it's only going to get worse after COVID because every university that just went online because they had to can say, you know, we know now know how to do this, so maybe we could have an, a couple online programs so we no longer have those distance barriers uh, that we've had for a while between most of our institutions. Cost is a big problem. It's hard for us to deliver higher education because we're a very labor intensive industry, but those costs are also making it difficult for parents as well as students to really attend school and, and, and without being saddled with incredible debt. Funding, you know, from our governments has been declining and certainly in, in, the, in the states uh, because other priorities have become more important. And, and certainly, methods to try to hold us accountable has, uh, you know, you're getting a lot of money from us, you're getting a lot of money from parents. Where is, where is the benefit of this four-year degree? Um, there's lots of people who are pointing to us saying, you're falling very short of your mission, higher education. 
And we see this uh, being represented in a number of ways, including institutional closings, institutional consolidations, as well as crises. So that's having a plan, developing a plan to deal with that turbulent environment. But then once we have the plan, are they being effectively deployed? And I've done lots and lots of strategic planning uh, development in the, in the nonprofit sector, including higher education, my institution particularly. And I got to tell you, the most disappointing thing is everybody spends a lot of time on a strategic plan and it becomes inactive. It gets filed away on a shelf. You know, good job, everybody, but it gets put away. Maybe it comes out occasionally. Uh, maybe it comes out during accreditation. Uh, maybe it comes out when our board of trustees is in town. But there really is no straight line from strategy through implementation, from strategy to the point of impact to the people we serve uh, in higher education. And then a lot of those plans have limited accountability. Sometimes they really don't have any metrics in them. They tell you what the priority is with no metric. Sometimes there's no timeline for when it's going to be reached. I mean, if it's a five-year plan, do all of them get completed in the last year of the plan? Um, there are no milestones or rarely milestones about how we're going to hit them along the way. And more often than not, there's no owner. There's no one held responsible inside that strategic plan. So, you know, and I'm going to quickly go through this, but if we, oh, we, you know, we look to Toyota as, as an exemplar, I mean, they are facing, uh, they're self-identified once in a century disruption from the auto industry to the mobility industry. So they're seeing so many things coming together, autonomy, autonomous vehicles, alternative energy, shared assets when people don't have their own vehicles, but we share vehicles. And many other things are causing them to really take a step back and saying, this is a real sea change in, in, in our future. And we need to develop, first of all, a strategy uh, how are we going to how are we going to be successful through this? So they're expanding what they're doing now. They're not just engineering individual vehicles. They're now moving to engineering whole mobility systems. And like Toyota does, they're doing lots of experiments. They're pioneering solid state batteries and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. They're not putting all of their money, all of their chips on double zero on the relay wheel. They're spreading out their bets, seeing which one's going to be successful. They're partnering with ride hailing firms and logistics firms because of that sharing that's going to take place. And many, many other things. I think, I think if, we watch, if you watch the Olympics uh, in Japan, you saw the, the, their uh, fleet of shared autonomous vehicles. You can start to see some of the directions that they're heading. But they've also been very clear in their plan that they are going to spend massive sums of money on lengthy and many experiments, many of which are going to fail, that's going to take a lot out of them, while at the same time, they need to defend their current employees, right? Respect for people. They're not going to do this by letting people go. So that's their plan. The deployment is critical. They are connecting the dots from value, from what the plan is to how frontline workers are going to create value. And those frontline workers are hearing the message. You need to help us free up resources to support this respond to disruption, Hoshen. We're going to need to increase production rate with no additional capital spending. You need to continue to sustain world best quality. We're going to rethink every aspect of our production activities, a broader scope rather than just looking at processes in a short period of time. And they're doing this, and again, making it clear to the employees, we're doing this because it's important to our survival and your jobs. That's strategy deployment. So there are lots of challenges facing us. Strategy plus strategy deployment will get there. Question is, what's the state of practice of Hoshin Conry in higher education? So the spoiler alert is not much. Uh, you know, looking at the literature, there have been some brief mentions of Hoshin Conry in high, higher education. Uh, a, a literature review by Ahmed in 2016. It's a really expansive literature review. And if you want to learn a lot about Hoshin Conry, it's something worth reading. But it really is only a, a very cursory connection uh, to higher education, Hoshin Conry in higher education. So I wouldn't go there if you want to find out about higher ed. But if you want to find out about Hoshin Conry, it's good. Bob Emiliani, uh, who, you know, one, one of the greats in uh, lean higher education, who actually was one of the first to bring lean 
to the classroom. He discussed Hoshin Kanri as a tool, but simply just as a list of tools in, in one one is building out academic courses. But really that, that's, that's about it from a conceptual perspective. From applications of Hoshin Kanri, I have a list of, of uh, uh, institutions here and I'll go through each of them uh, quickly. Um, but um, I do, before I go into the list here, you know, one of the things that's so wonderful about these conferences is I got to attend uh, one of the workshops uh, earlier this morning by Kim Snage and Kim Gingerich up at the University of Waterloo. And they, I would add them to this list because they showed a really compelling case of how they're building strategy deployment um, from, from their unit of continuous improvement closely connected to the strategic uh, plan of the institution. So hats off to the University of Waterloo. And if you didn't attend their, their talk, be, be sure to watch it. It was just very, very good. Um, so let me, let me go through some of these uh, again briefly. Istanbul uh, Technical University, uh, a publication in 2007, you know, based on their li the limited evidence of Hoshin Kanri in higher education, they wanted to see whether uh, or how it might be applied. And their interests were not just in Hoshin Kanri, which is kind of a process approach uh, to strategy deployment, but they also wanted to introduce simultaneously, and many of you are probably familiar with the balanced scorecard, which is like a kind of a performance-based approach. You know, what are your metrics and how are you going to measure things? Uh, putting those together for strategic management and deployment. And uh, they, uh, in looking at a, a, an engineering management graduate program, they provide some evidence of, of how one would um, build uh, the, st the strategy deployment um, in, in, a, in a graduate program. And, you know, heavy on catchball, uh, that is sharing uh, what's going back and forth across different levels uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the management program uh, to make sure that there's clear alignment and integration of the strategies before we start reaching implementation plans. Uh, so that's about where they end their article. There was no discussion of implementation, but they do start to show some of the nice connections between uh, alignment, build, building, uh, building the deployment, not implementing it. In a really interesting article by the uh, quality and reliability team at the Warwick Manufacturing Group at the University of Warwick, and the, the, one of their responsibilities is to provide training, consultation, research for, for the manufacturing industry. Um, they wanted to make sure uh, that they sharpened the saw, that they are at the highest end of what they're doing, so they will become the go-to um, teacher, consultant, um, and so forth. Uh, so they started looking at a five-year um, uh, sort of strategic plan with deployment, uh, which would get them to, again, maintain this high level of reputation. And what you see here is sort of, a, and it looks a little bit like a piece of an X matrix, and in fact it is. Um, but what they are showing here is um, using catchball is how do they connect their vital few goals? And that's what's across the top, the columns across the top. Uh, the first one being increase our publication rate because that creates visibility. Um, visibility creates you know, recognition uh, in the field and that's gonna get you customers. Um, how does that connect with the key processes of the things that they would do as a group? Their research, their teaching, and their consulting. So what they did was, again, by do, using the catchball process, they could say, you know, here's how uh, we're going to increase our publication rate by the things that we're going to do in the areas of research, teaching, and consulting. And you can see the filled in dots, the open dots, or the small dots, showing whether there's a really strong connection or a looser connection. They would then hold monthly reviews. How are they making progress against the plans? Are we publishing more? Um, you know, how can we keep that going? They would also do annual reviews to make sure that their vision and, and vital few goals are still correct and up to date. Are we making progress against milestones? Are there new milestones? Uh, do we, can we reconfirm our individual commitment? So a really nice example of, of bringing um, uh, Hushin Kanri into an academic unit. Cardiff University, and I love this uh, example, uh, they had a strategic plan that was overwhelming. So Sarah Richards and her colleagues said, 
let's reverse engineer the X matrix, put everything that's so overwhelming into the X matrix and visually show that there are way too many strategic priorities. There are way too many projects and way too few people uh, to actually get them done. So you can imagine a, a, an X matrix with just, you know, at the top of the X matrix, which are those priority projects, just many, 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 many priority projects showing that it's going to be impossible to get these done. And a really, a really neat way of thinking about how to use the X matrix. And their goal was to say, maybe it would help people see this and say, aha, the visual representation helps. Now we need to prioritize. Let's do year one, year two, back some of them off. Well, it didn't work. Uh, they liked the concept, but there was no change in practice, in part because they had new leadership. Not to be outdone, uh, Sarah and her colleagues pivoted and said, well, if we're not going to be able to use this university-wide, let's bring it in to an aspect of the university. And they moved it into uh, improving the speed and quality of the admissions process. So they created the X matrix uh, for a, st a three-year strategic objectives and everything that flows from there, as well as developing some pr uh, priority projects linked to actual living A3 descriptions of, the, of what those projects are going to be. So let me show you a little bit of that. Um, and again, I, I know these are hard to see, but I just want you to grasp it conceptually. Um, you know, you can start to see this X matrix with the three-year objectives at the bottom, how it comes over to uh, six-year objectives on the left side, projects on the top. Um, you can see who the resources are off to the right. Um, and that big orange arrow uh, uh, talks about one particular project that they're doing in this year, which was to improve the admissions experience of um, overseas students. And if you followed that very thin row all the way across, you'd see a blue link. And if we were able to go to that link, we would actually go to this A3. So it's directly connected to the strategic plan of the admissions um, process. And this should look very familiar to us who use the A3. Um, you can see with the purple um, post-it notes, you know, this is really a current state process map. Below that are what did we learn from the process map, the current, current map. Uh, if you go to the top right, you say, well, here's the future state process map in green. And here are the changes we're going to make. And below that, here are all the things that we need to do by when and how are we going to know that they, that they get done. Uh, so it's a really, I, I think, a really nice way of, of taking strategy deployment all the way to the, to the end, to the finish line, to make sure that every project actually gets done by using this A3 approach. Michigan Technological University, our, our good colleague, uh, Ruth Archer, uh, she shared with me some work that's being done up, up at, at her institution. And I know she and one of her, her, her boss, uh, Teresa Coleman Kaiser, is here. Uh, so, uh, and I haven't had a chance to catch up with Teresa yet today. But Teresa uh, oversees, she's an associate vice president. She oversees the administration operation system. And what Teresa has done is really for her division, for her area, has really started connecting the vision of the institution with where, the, where they are right now, uh, with, with uh, their current situational awareness. So she will identify annual themes based on the university strategic plan. She will then work with her, her, her units uh, to create goals for each of those themes. And there'd be a separate A3 for each one of those themes. And then she would work in, in a very much catch ball way, working back and forth with them to develop annual performance goals uh, to make sure there, there'll be success in reaching the A3s for each of those theme goals. And then, uh, as I understand it from Ruth, there are separate monthly meeting to discuss those unit A3 goals. So again, that's up and down communication, as well as a, a separate meeting on individual performance goals. And I think Ruth told me that this year, uh, she has been assigned sort of the deputy, where her res additional responsibility for Ruth is to sort of help support the others and just to be available to make sure that everybody's making progress throughout the month on these um, strategic uh, deployments. Um, a little bit of work that we've done here at Bowling Green, uh, one thing that we've been pretty good at is creating plans. One thing that we've been notoriously bad at is deploying them. 
Uh, so in our uh, latest strategic plan, we uh, I was able to sort of lobby my, my president uh, to say, why don't we use some of these Hoshin Conry principles to develop our strategic plan deployment? Uh, so you can see our plan up at the top in, in, in bold, and you can sort of see this waterfall kind of technique where the first waterfall flows down to a university planning matrix, which is our X matrix. But then we have either a matrix or some diagram that shows how the vice president or divisional, their plan is going to be connecting to the university's plan and how the college or office is going to connect to the provost or other vice presidents and all the way down to the department level, right down to the academic unit level uh, for those of us on the academic side of the house. And on the on the left side, you'll see the project tracking template. So while we know that there are now these built-in connections as part of our deployment, um, we want to make sure that they're actually getting done, that, uh, you know, what, what we were finding in the past is the only time we'd even start thinking about uh, strategy deployment is at the end of a semester when we're talking about it or at the end of the year when it's time for us to do our annual reviews and we talk about have we, have we met some of our uh, deployment goals. So again, just quickly, uh, uh, here's the X matrix that we have. And again, they all look a little different. You know, they all have their little bit of tweaks, but our, um, our five-year strategic objectives are at the bottom. Uh, these are the big things, and, and we use gray bands so we can follow around the direct connection uh, between what's in uh, the, 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 the five-year goal to what are the um, annual uh, metrics and goals that we're gonna have up to the priority projects on top. So you can easily say for each one of them, which one is gonna be important. Um, you, you can see over to the right, um, uh, you know, we, where the resources are gonna be found. And I'll just draw your attention to the, the, the orange arrow again, which says 1.3, add programs in high demand. Um, this was one of the um, annual um, uh, priorities or projects uh, priority initiatives that were part of um, redefining student success. Thank you, Jose. Um, so that 1.3, adding programs in high demand, that would then spill over into this project ta uh, tracking template. So you can see it's a template um, with some red information built in. That's how we fill it in. Um, it would be a little bit of a project description. It would say, who's the responsible lead? That's Joe Whitehead, our provost. Who's on the team? Certainly going to be the deans, undergraduate and graduate admissions, and so forth. And then what is going to be done? What are the actions that are going to be taken? Who's going to do them? When are they going to get done? And how will we know they're getting done? And to the right of that, the column with, with the colors in it is our typical you know, uh, green, yellow, red to give us a quick visual snapshot of how things are going. Uh, so if we're starting to fall behind in this timeline, we might start turning things to yellow um, or we, if things are really going, uh, really struggling, we might turn them to red. And again, we've made it really clear. Red is not a reflection on you. Red is a reflection on we're struggling with a process and we're all going to help you uh, together. All the vice presidents are going to come together and solve that to help turn it from red to yellow to green. Yeah. And we also did uh, the 30, 60, 90 um, so that we knew what was happening in different uh, periods of time across all of these priorities. And we would bring this massive roll up 30, 60, 90 to every one of our board of trustees meetings. And we would show the board because they were very interested in how, in, in, you know, they're very, you know, these are outside business people. They're very interested in strategy and strategy deployment. So we were able to show them the clear connection between our X matrix, between our priority projects, between the 30, 60, 90 plan, and where we were green, yellow, and very occasionally a red. Um, some of you know that I, I had the last year, I uh, had a, just a wonderful opportunity uh, to serve as the interim president at a, a local two-year community college offering associate degrees rather than the four-year or, or graduate degrees that we offer at Bowling Green. So I went up the street a little bit and for the year. And uh, again, you know, just a suggestion, never become an interim president during COVID-19. Uh, it makes things just that much harder. Um, but, you know, we had COVID-19, but the community colleges in Ohio and really throughout the country were facing some real enrollment challenges. So the, the, the president who had left had done a terrific job working with the community, developing a really nice strategic plan 
uh, with with uh, five, um, uh, I'm sorry, six uh, high level strategic improvement goals, about 20 key objectives. And they had developed probably 40 plus metrics of how they were going to measure each of those key objectives. Uh, and, you know, it was just way too many objectives. So we tried to do a little pruning there. But what was missing, what, you know, what, you know, us lean people was kind of obvious, is there was no connective tissue between what these uh, key objectives are and how you're going to get to moving the needle on any uh, uh, of the um, metrics that were important. So it was pretty easy to work with the vice presidents and for them to work with their report to use a, a very, I call it a simple 30, 60, 90 plan. So for every quarter, we would have a separate 30, 60, 90 plan. Uh, you can see, this, and this is just a small section. This is just for the first um, uh, strategic improvement goal. But you can see we've got four uh, key objectives. Uh, for those key uh, objectives, we have two different vice presidents who are responsible uh, for getting those done. They're the leads. And those vice presidents and I, we would sit down and we again would catch ball and they would catch ball with their uh, subordinates. And we come back and do that until we were able to identify some very specific things that we would complete at the first half of the month or the second half of the month. And then in our individual meetings, our one-on-one -on -one meetings, as well as our weekly vice president meetings, uh, where we have the group of vice presidents and myself getting together, we would share where we are on these 30, 60, 90s. And we could see, are we making good progress? Where we think, well, if we're making progress on these things, we should be able to say we're going to move the needle on, on some of those metrics. So we would, again, come, come to each other with green, yellow, and red. And again, yellow, nothing to worry about now, but we, we know we have to pay attention to it. But if we saw red, then we come together as a team, problem solve, uh, countermeasures, and, and move things forward. And I was surprised when I, uh, delighted, I should say, uh, when I spoke to John Hogg about, you know, I'd like to talk about Hoshin Khan Ray uh, because of, you know, my thinking over the past couple of years. And he said, well, Bill, um, you, you'll be really interested to learn that Vincent Weigel has sort of led our Lean HE European Steering, Co Steering Committee through sort of a, a, an X matrix process. And what you see here, and again, hard to see, you know, get down into the details, but again, looking at the, the general X matrix, again, starting in the bottom right and, and working our way around this board, they, they have a mission and vision in the middle, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, they have strategic goals uh, at the bottom underneath the mission. These are the, the, the long term um, that they're focusing on. You follow the arrow around to their programs and focus, which have a, a shorter term, one to two years up around through the improvement initiatives, which they need to work on right now. And then as the oval indicates, you know, who's going to lead and who's going to support them with the measures and KPIs immediately underneath. Uh, so you can see lots of interesting applications of how Hoshin Kanri has been introduced in very, very different ways um, in, in higher education. So it can work. It doesn't seem to be being used. And, and if I haven't said this already, if you are using it and knowing uh, or know someone who's using it, could you please let me know? Because I, I, you know, sent out uh, telegrams uh, to all my friends in the HE, Lean HE community and say, hey, do you know anything about this? And that's where I found what I found. But if there's more going on, uh, you know, I'll certainly know to add University of Waterloo to the list now. Uh, but if, if you know of more, I'd certainly be delighted to hear about it. But we're not doing it as, as much maybe as we should. Um, so what in our fourth and final learning goal, what can we do uh, to promote and support Hoshin Conry in higher education? So why? Why are we not doing it? Well, re, you know, let me restate that the success of our industry, if you will, what we do, and as Karen Morton said, we have a critical purpose to society, right? The transmission and, uh, and, and, and development of knowledge. Fundamentally, that's what we do. Our success is critical to society. So if we're struggling in a very turbulent environment, what are, how are we going to plan our way out of that? And how are we going to deploy those plans? Hoshin Connery is the ultimate Again, continuous improvement cycle or gap analysis to get us there. It will help us achieve those, th those successes. 
it's in our lean wheelhouse. Maybe it's the it's at the bottom of your bucket of tools. Um, maybe it's a new tool you need to add to your bucket, but it might be time to maybe bring it up a little bit um, in, 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 um, in your toolkit. Um, we can see that you don't have to do this institution wide to really benefit from it. Uh, you can see that at Michigan Technological University. You can see it at Cardiff. You can see it at in uh, Istanbul's Technical University. They didn't do it university-wide like we did at Owens and Bowling Green, but it still worked. It still was uh, made a contribution to the, the deployment of those strategic plans. So, you know, if, if, if it's in our wheelhouse and we have so much to offer, why aren't we seeing more? So assuming, and I, I'd like to assume we all want to be part of strategy deployment, how can that process be improved? Well, how do we do everything? We, we're great at this. Uh, let's look at a root cause. Let's figure out, maybe we can get some insights into why there has been more limited application of Hoshin Khan rate in higher education. So this is just the beginning, some of my own preliminary thoughts. And of course, I'd love for people to add to the fishbone over time. But, you know, thinking of, you know, what, what might be some of the reasons? And I'll, I'll just sort of briefly mention a couple of the fishbones. Let me start at the top uh, fishbone, which is LHE practitioners. You know, you know, one, one of the you know, offshoots of the bone is maybe we just don't have a whole lot of training or experience, particularly in Hoshin Khan Rhee. Um, we, we just we just haven't seen it, and we uh, so we haven't done it. We don't know how to do it. Maybe it's limited resources. Maybe we're so stretched thinly, you know, our you know pedal to the metal kind of thing that we don't think we have the resources to take on yet one more thing uh, in addition to all the other uh, projects that we're doing across our institutions. Or maybe we feel that we, we don't have influence. We've never been invited uh, to strategy meetings, uh, let alone strategy deployment. So, you know, maybe we don't think there's influence there. Um, probably lots of other things we could add. Um, let's go to the bottom, the, the bone right below that, HE leaders. I mean, maybe they don't know this is a tool in our toolkit because we've never told them it's a tool in our toolkit. Or maybe, and Karen, I think, did a very nice job of teeing this one up in particular. Maybe they're worried about a loss of control over the outcome. Once you start making this so visual, once you put it up on a map and bring it to your board of trustees or governors or whatever you call, and they start seeing red and yellow and green, maybe they're going to say, okay, uh, we need to help you figure out why you're not getting your strategic plan deployed. Uh, so maybe they don't want to lose control over the message that they're sharing with their board. One hypothesis, um, or maybe they're just resistant to change. They've got, you know, we've been doing it this way uh, for so many years. We we don't really want to change. I have two more bones up there under planning process, under the HE environment. I'm sure we can add more bones and fill out bones and sub bones and sub sub bones. But you get the idea that we can use this very important tool that we have in our toolbox uh, to help us make some progress on what some of the root causes might be, tools to prioritize those. And then maybe take those to address some of these root causes. So to start looking at a particular root cause and maybe take some corrective actions. So I'm not saying that we've gotten there yet because we've, you know, again, this is my make-believe, uh, uh, you know, fishbone. But if it's because lean practitioners um, have, have no Hoshin Khan retraining or experience, well, what are some corrective actions we can take? Well, maybe we can grow our own experts. We're really good at doing that. We're, we, we, we're quick learners. There are some people who are already doing it. Um, we, maybe we could have one big global workshop on Hoshin Khan Re uh, to share amongst ourselves, uh, to, to learn more about Hoshin Khan Re and the tricks of the trade in doing that effectively. Maybe you just need to look locally and find a, a for-profit organization or one of your alumni or a board member who does Hoshin Khan Re in her or his organization, and let's pick their brains. Uh, but we need to add Hoshin Kanri to our application toolkit. If it's because the leaders have no knowledge of Hoshin Kanri, well, corrective action, let's get a seat at the table, the strategy deployment table. Uh, you know, I, I was arguing the other day for the elevator pitch for lean higher education. Maybe we need an elevator pitch for Hoshin Kanri. Maybe we need to show them what can be done with Hoshin Kanri practices, take them to other organizations, even non higher education institutions, just to show them the power of Hoshin Khan Ray. So, so you get the idea. I think there's a path forward for us. So I'm going to sort of end here uh, you know, with these sort of closing comments. Higher education um, is really, I think, facing a lot of challenges. 
Uh, and some of those are going to be very significant. And I know people say, oh, Bill, poo poo, you know, it's, you know, it'll, it'll come back. You know, students somehow are going to materially multiply like rabbits. Um, uh, go, you know, uh, legislators are going to say, you know what? I thought you were misusing money. Mm, I'm, I'm going to continue to give you more. Sorry about, sorry about taking some away from you. I mean, it, the challenges are going to be there. They are going to be addressed by finding a strategic competitive advantage to get there. Um, that's what a good strategic plan is going to be. We need to help. Either, if we're not developing plan, we need to help deploy that plan. We can do it. The lean higher education community is, this is what we're cut out to do, the strategy deployment. It's built on lean pillars of continuous improvement and respect for people. We know it's good for the entire university. Um, Hosh and Conry is readily, readily applicable to higher education. We, we've seen it being done. And again, we can do so much. We can add great value. And I don't want to get so Pollyannish to say we can save higher education, we can save our institution, but we can play a much more valued role in that process. And I think that's where we need to take ourselves as a lean higher education community. It's that time of year where the holidays are upon us. And if people are asking you for gift ideas for yourself, if you're thinking you wanna learn more about, Lean, um, about Hoshin Kanri, here's three books I would suggest adding to your library. Um, none of these are directly about higher education, but all of them are very um, accessible, approachable material that more immediately translate over to the higher education um, uh, framework. Uh, so I, th I think you'll like the books by Dennis, by Hutchins, and, and by Jackson. Um, some additional resources, and again, you, you'll have access to these later. As you might imagine, there are um, probably as many books on Hoshin Kanri as there are people or consultants who are doing Hoshin Kanri. So I tried to, you know, separate some of the, what I think is the, uh, the, the, the wheat from the chaff here. And here are six, I call them second level books. If you've got more money than you know how to spend, or you've got money you got to spend before the end of the year, maybe some of these books would be good books to add to your library as well. I have a little ribbon in the, in the middle one in the top. Um, that's Bob King's book. It's one of the first early books, one of the first books on Hoshin Kanri in, in America, uh, or uh, so it's translated outside of Japan, I should say. Uh, so it's a good book from a historical perspective, not really accessible, uh, but, but a really good book. And then some other resources that are, are, are very valuable as well. And then, of course, a, a long list of uh, uh, unreadable uh, references of things that I've cited, which if you want to find them, you, you, you know, when you get the uh, PowerPoint, you'll be able to get there. So thank you. Um, you know, uh, I appreciate the time. It's, it's always great to talk to my colleagues. I feel so energized to be part of this group. Um, I do want to pass along all of our thanks to John Hogg, uh, to the University of Strathclyde, to the global Lean HE community. There is probably no better conference you could go to uh, because it's not just a great conference, but you bring the conference back to you in the workplace. So thank you. And we've got 12 minutes for comments, questions, and so forth. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. Well, certainly there was a lot of activity on the chat during that. Now, I've managed to harvest most of that, so I'm going to run through them now. So, Leila Brower says, oh, do we have an example of a successful HK within an HE institution? Would love to know and to chat about it if there are any. So, when I, when I was talking about some examples and... Um, uh, Again, uh, maybe maybe a good way. Let me just step back a little second. It, it's it's like it's like we're earlier in the in the workshop. We're saying what is lean higher education? We couldn't define it and wasn't actually the same thing to everybody. I think there's the same thing in the Hoshin Conry community. So I would say that at Bowling Green, uh, the example at Cardiff. Um, uh, you know, some of the work that's being done at Mich Michigan Technological uh, University, um, you know, some of those are good pieces, oh, and, and Waterloo, I'm sorry, and Waterloo, those might be good examples of pieces as they're coming together to sort of build the whole. But um, Leila, I, I don't think I could point to one school that could show you from, you know, um, all the way around the circle yet, uh, although Bowling Green is, is pretty darn close. So if you'd like to talk, I, I'd be happy to share that with you. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, now we've got from Luke Fillimore. I'm currently building Hoshin Cunry with two schools here at Nottingham. 
but it's, a, but it's at school level, not institutional level. Has Bill ever heard of an approach where relatively autonomous academic departments can influence upwards by going in at a kind of middle level with Hoshin Kanri? Yeah, it's a great, great, look, it's a great question. Um, and I think much like uh, our, um, I guess I'll call it our tactics in lean higher education in general, is that if we can't get the senior leaders to look at it yet, let's do that pilot program. Let's do something local. Um, let's let's um, Then they'll show people what it's all about. And, and the great work that Krista Schulte is doing at the University of Michigan. I mean, she started in one small area, shared services, and then people come in and they look in and say, what are you doing in there? And oh my gosh, that's really interesting. And now because of the way that she sort of set that up very tactically, now it's starting to spill out to the entire institution. I think we can follow that same model uh, that Krista has launched at University of Michigan. And I know other of you, uh, others have done that as well, starting locally to expand to say, why don't you come to this report out and find out you know, uh, what this RIE is all about. It's a good way of starting to influence up uh, would be my recommendation. So that probably touches upon Diana McPherson's question, which is how do you convince your dean to do a strategic alignment? Well, I, I'm, ah, that's a great question. Um, I, 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 I can convince a dean at Bowling Green, um, but uh, I would first ask, does the dean have a strategic plan? I, I might want to start there uh, because sometimes lots of colleges don't even have real good strategic plans, right, with metrics and objectives and so forth. Um, but I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it is um, taking them somewhere. Um, you know, I don't know where these workshops will live, but finding ways to share a little bit more about Hoshin Kanri. I think the, the section in, in Karen Martin's book, where I think she's going to talk a little bit about, where she talked a little bit about Hoshin Kanri, maybe that's enough uh, to share with the dean. They don't like, deans don't like to read, right? Give them a one page memo. Uh, and I was a dean, so I can say that. So give them something short and sweet uh, as a way to sort of tease them and take them to the next level, maybe for a visit, maybe for a more detailed talk, then maybe for a pilot. Thank you. And um, now I've got two kind of linked questions here, so I'm going to say them both together. Uh, Susan Alley says, what advice would you have for convincing an area that, it, that thinks they have a strategic plan, but are missing the how to implement it? And if you just hold on for a sec, I'll also read out Jean Dayton's uh, question, which is building on Susan's question and linking in with Karen's last session. How to let go of the things they need to, to enable the right things to be successfully implemented. How do they go about navigating that? Just plain stopping activities with different stakeholders? Yeah, so I, I you know, there are, and I, I, you know, I'll look at like Steve and Steinair and others who I think are just so good uh, at, at putting together really interesting ways to convince people they don't know enough. Um, but for me, it, as I said earlier with my work at Owens Community College, it was, you know, here's a great plan over here here are the metrics the board of trustees is going to be looking at and there's absolutely there's this giant void in the middle and how do you cross that void so i think sometimes it's helping show people the void in their thinking that they they don't know how to get from point a to point b uh and 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 we have a way of showing them uh, some very i think useful useful techniques for doing that. So I, I think, I, I think you know, if they know, if, if you create a trusting environment, we've talked a lot about that. If we show, if we start a lot of what we do with, it's not people, it's the process, so that they can be vulnerable uh, and share and say, I, I don't really know, uh, you know, uh, I think I got a good plan, but I don't know what I get from the plan uh, to actually get uh, everybody in the unit align with that plan. I don't know how to get there. Please help me. We can start to show them some of uh, the tools of our trade to help them do that. But in, in a partnership, in, in an educational partnership, where we're, we're, we're showing them how to do it, but also teaching them how to do it so they'll be more comfortable uh, doing catch ball uh, in, in the future. I mean, how often do we hear someone uh, up at a higher level in, in, in an institution say, here you go. And there is no feedback loop. There's no opportunity to ask where those came from. There's no opportunity to talk about how we're going to, uh, you know, are they the right ones? Did you, you may, maybe this one isn't going to work. Uh, have you thought about this? If you don't have those, then you're not going to get very far. So just doing some of the, you know, I call them the uh, basic blocking and tackling kinds of things, uh, we can help them move, uh, move forward 
in strategy deployment? Great questions. We've, we've got more. We've got more. Okay. Um, Vincent Regal, um, Bill, do you see the rise in Udemy and Coursera, et cetera, as a potential driver for HE institutions to engage in serious strategy development and deployment or, controversially, become obsolete, most of them, he says. Okay. Vincent, thank you for asking that question because I cut it out of my talk because I, I, I was very uh, sensitive about time. Um, if you don't know the Coursera model, go online and look at Coursera. Right now, they've got over 4,000 programs, for many of them being taught from some of the best courses being taught from some of the best universities around the world. And you can take courses, as many as you want, for $49 a month. Now, think about what an employer would say. I need to quickly train my employees on some skill set or something. I need them to take courses. Employers, as we're seeing, uh, certainly um, in, in, in Northwest Ohio, they're looking more for uh, not um, – you know, education for that you might need in the future, but education you need right now. A four-year degree is sort of building out for those, you know, what are you going to need for the rest of your life? Whereas they're saying, I need somebody who can do coding right now. And I can't wait four years for a higher institution to do it. So I'm going to go to Google and Google has a 12 course program that's going to teach me, teach me as, as an unemployed person or someone who's looking for a new job, how to do that. I don't have to go through the horrible admissions process, wait every uh, you know six months before I can take a course at a university and pay a lot of money to do it. I think it's very threatening right now. Uh, and I think we that's something we really need to pay attention to. And I worry when Amazon gets into our business or when Disney gets into our business. Because who can do a better show than Disney and who can get it out to more people faster than Amazon? Thank you, Vincent. Okay. Um, uh, Tamala Bradham has, been sa has said, I've been asked to help tie the university strategic plan to the finance and admin strategic framework to our own strategic plan. Can you use this framework to align all the plans? I'm trying to visualize the X matrix across different levels. You had a slide, but I couldn't see how they were aligned. Yes, yes. And that was purposeful, um, you know, because it was it was a big picture slide. But what you can do is, is, is the answer is yes. Um, you would have, the, and let's say, let's start at the university level, and let's say that's the president. Um, that's, that's the university-wide X plan, uh, X matrix, okay? That if we do everything in that X matrix, we are going to hit all the strategic objectives of the university. I'm going to use the chief academic officer as the next person as the example. Uh, and uh, or maybe let me use the CFO because you talked about the CFO. That CFO could then form an X matrix or, or something like an X matrix that works at that level, which says, OK, here are the pieces I'm responsible for in the university level strategic plan. What am I going to have to do in my division, my CFO division, uh, to align with those? So I'm going to have to start building out ob uh, priorities, objectives, uh, projects uh, that I'm going to do at, at my uh, division level to make sure that all the things I need to do for the president get met, so the university plan. And there might be some things that are in addition uh, to what um, that are maybe a little outside the strategic plan, because maybe there are high priorities uh, uh, th that are critical to that division. And it's okay to have a few that are out of there, but the, the worst thing is when you don't have that alignment where the energy of the institution isn't aligned with what's needed to deploy the university strategic plan, which will give us the competitive advantage to beat the pants off of our competitors. Um, well, do you know, Bill, I'm just looking at the time in horror. I would love to be able to keep asking uh, questions and pass on the comments. I'll pass them on to you afterwards uh, you. just so you can see them. But I'm afraid that's us pretty much out of time for what has been a very amazing session. Lots of interactivity on the discussion forum. Thanks to everyone for your amazing questions. But if you could now join me in thanking Bill in the normal way with comments in the chat book and I will give you a clap. Thank you Thank so you, much. Everyone. Thank really you. Really engaging, really engaging. Okay, well, as I said, I think we could probably have gone on all night with that one. Certainly there was no shortage of feedback whatsoever. 
But it just remains for me to say another thank you to Bill Bowser for his fascinating talk and also your questions and answers today. Um, join me um, after the break for what is going to be quite a big event. It is the handover ceremony. But before all of that, we have just 15 minutes left of this conference to go and network, to go and meet people, to connect and build our connections. So please go and do that right now. And I will see you back here in about 15 minutes, but go and enjoy the meeting hub for the last time. Take care.